Hey everyone, this is Ryan Robinson here. If you haven't seen me on before, I'm one of the guys who does a lot of the work behind the scenes with the podcast. And just wanted to jump on before some of these podcasts coming up to ask if you would be willing to give us some feedback about what is and what is not working with the podcast so far. Um, so we've set up a survey on the website, and if you have a couple minutes be- before or after this podcast, just jump over to menonodes.com slash podcasts slash survey. And you'll be able to fill it out there, and that'll help us figure out what we can keep doing from here on. Thank you. Hey, y'all. This is Ebony Adedayo. I am a pastor and the founder of the Kinky Curly Theological Collective here in St. Paul, Minnesota. And this is Steve Kynes. I'm pastor for the homeless in Portland, Oregon. And this is BGWG, Black Gal, White Guy. We are a podcast that specializes, talks about, deliberates, ponders, um, argues about the intersection of social justice and faith, and how we as people of faith, people who are clergy, people who are lay leaders, people who are doing the work of God, are engaging in the social justice issues of our day and age. That is what we do. That is what we are about. Well, that pretty much covers it all. (laughs) Um, So over the last couple of podcasts, this is maybe podcast number eight, number seven, number eight. We have talked about climate change. We've talked about feminism. We've talked about housing. We've talked about um, police brutality in the Philando Castile verdict. Um, tonight, we will be talking about the Me Too campaign. Before we get started with our topic tonight, I'm wondering, Steve, do you have any resources for us? I do have a resource. It's actually a resource that we have mentioned before, but we've never recommended it before. And that is the podcast called Code Switch. Um, Code Switch is an NPR podcast and uh, I love Code Switch because it's, it's kind of a, it's an NPR podcast. And so they're always talking like this all the time. And that way you can be, feel calm and cool while they tell you some really horrific items anyway. And so it's an NPR podcast. It's kind of a, a a news uh, journaling podcast, but it's all dealing with issues uh, that affect uh, the people of color community, and it's uh, done by people of color. Uh, and so, from my perspective, from the from the white guy perspective, it's I feel like sometimes I'm listening into a conversation from the outside. Uh, so that way, I'm hearing, okay, you know, this is some real stuff. This is real, uh, real issues that are being dealt with, and every single podcast teaches me something new it opens up my eyes and something new and uh, uh anyway so i recommend it i know that ebony listens to it and i'm suspecting that she recommends it too oh yeah highly recommend it on my list i've been slacking in my podcast game the last couple of weeks so <laughs> i need to um connect back to Code Switch, and there's some others that I really enjoy listening to as well. Um, Get back. It's it's still good. I know it is. Well, thank you for your recommendation. My recommendation, I actually thought you were going to say Evicted, um, because I know we've been talking about that book, and I don't think we've ac- actually recommended it or referenced it. I um, am maybe a third way through the book. I bought it initially because the book is um, by Matthew Desmond, who is a sociologist. It's actually about my hometown, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, and the, the housing crisis that's happening in Milwaukee. And Milwaukee is just one city where this is taking place. It's actually happening all over our country. Um, but still, the, the book is really profound to me it, because it because it is talking about where I'm from and this guy is just doing this um, sociological inventory of the housing crisis where my people still live. Um, I did get a chance to see Matthew Desmond yesterday. He was here in Minnesota um, speaking at the University of Minnesota and did a, uh, 
did a talk yesterday afternoon, and he's doing another event tonight. I didn't get a chance to go see that because of kids and dinner and all the other um, insurmountable responsibilities that I have on my plate. But I highly recommend the book. If he's in your city, your town, I highly recommend that you go see him because he is a really great speaker. Even though his writing is very dense, he's still a very great verbal communicator. So those are my recommendations this week. And I'm also going to recommend Evicted. I'm kind of in the same place as you, Ebony. I'm about a, a little more than a quarter of the way through the book, uh, and I'm still working through it. I highly recommend it from my perspective as a person who deals with housing crisis a lot. He's got it right. And I love the perspective that he's coming from, not just, oh, we're evicted, oh, poor pitiful us, but also coming talking about landlords and managers and other things like that. So it's a, it's coming from a multifaceted point of view, and I, I highly recommend it. I, I totally agree. Um, one of the things I really appreciate in his analysis is not just the multifaceted layer um, in terms of the his uh his main protagonist. You see the renters, you see um, housing advocates, you see the lawyers, you see landlords, you see the sheriffs who come and um, who tell people that they're going to get evicted. You see the the movers, people who help in the family alongside of that. I also appreciate that he profiles two sides of Milwaukee. He appreciates the black. I mean, he profiles the black community. He um, profiles um, lower income white communities as well. I think a lot of times when we tell stories about poverty, even though poverty in our country is very racialized, the fact of the matter is people of color are not the only ones poor. White people are poor too. And the way that we talk about white poverty is quite different than the way that we talk about poverty when it comes to people of color. A lot of times when we talk about poverty in terms of people of color, it's always attached to individual actions, things that people did that um, that caused them to be poor, like having children out of wed wedlock, mass incarceration, so many other things. We don't talk about white poverty in the same way. Um, and I think Matthew Desmond, in his book, he's presenting both sides of the issue for both blacks and whites and others who find themselves in this hellhole that is eviction. So I, I really appreciate that. And I think because of that, a lot of people really resonated with his approach. The speaker, well, the key, the person who opened his keynote yesterday talked about one of the people that he interviewed in her, his book was actually her nephew. And so, I mean, like a very personable, um, just a very personal approach to that. And I, I think that if he hadn't done that, the warm reception that he's getting because of the book might not be the case. Yeah. Well, then we both recommend it. And I think we're going to recommend to each other that we finish the book. That'd be great. Strongly recommended. <laughs> Let's get into our topic at hand tonight, Steve, the Me Too campaign. Um, for those of you who have not been paying attention to social media or the news or I mean, the world. They've been hiding in a shell somewhere. Yeah, God bless you for that. <laughs> uh, about a week ago, maybe a little bit over a week ago, on social media, this campaign called Me Too um, started to go viral um, in response to <clears throat> the sexual harassment and assault cases that have been coming to limelight um, as a result of, is it Harry Weinstein? Harvey, Harvey Weinstein. Harvey, Harry, Harvey, Henry, one of those H words. Um, <laughs> as a result of the allegations of rape that he's been charged with, but as also a result of some of the things that Nelly has also been charged with, uh, who's an African-American rapper, who I wasn't even aware of, like that was happening to him until tonight. I was reading some article um, saying that he has also been um, charged with some rape allegations as well. I was reading an article by Terry Crews, who's an African-American actor, who talked about his own... Um, history of victimization and rape by someone else, this African-American guy. And so Me Too campaign is really about elevating 
the stories and the identities of women um, who have been either sexually harassed or sexually assaulted. And um, as we have as we have done that, you've seen men also respond saying that, you know, I have that they're also victims of sexual assault, probably less around harassment. Um, even though men also experience that, we do know that sexual harassment and sexual assault is very gendered. And the way that it happens is about power. It's about domination. Um, it's about uh, controlling other people's lives. So I'm, I'm just wondering, Steve, um, a lot of women have came out and have talked about the ways that they have been harassed and assaulted. How, what has that been like for you as a, as a man, as a male, watching those things, seeing those things um, on social media, perhaps having those conversations and with your, with your own children, with your wife, like what is, what has that been like for you? Yeah. I mean, it's been, uh, it's been hard to see the pain that other people have been uh, have been living with. I think probably the most surprising thing for me, now I've already had talks with my wife and my daughters and they haven't, uh, they tell me that they haven't really experienced uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment, absolutely. Uh, that, that happens to every woman in our society, uh, but, uh, but sexual assault, no. But in, in uh, talking or listening to a lot of my friends, uh, I'm just like, wow, you know, I know this person. This person is a really, uh, is a really strong woman, really powerful, an important person in our community. But here's an aspect of themselves that is just coming out now. Here's something that they're, that they're willing to share now that they haven't before. And, and it, so I'm just like, okay, well, to me, that just adds to the strength of who they are. And yet, then I step back again. I've been thinking a lot about this. I just, you know, ever since this whole thing started, I've been thinking, thinking a lot. And I've been, and I'm going, you know what? Um, it, just because I know these things now, it, it doesn't mean that I shouldn't have known it before. I look at the statistics, you know, but one in five women have been raped sometime in their lives uh, in in our nation. And they can't determine exactly the statistics for sexual assault, uh, but it's very high. It's, it, you know, this is a context in which we live in. And so why am I surprised mm. at the number of women who are now coming forward saying, yeah, I've been sexually assaulted. Yeah, this is something that I've experienced. Yeah, this is something that really affected my life and, and uh, changed who I am. Yeah, there are trips that I couldn't make and things that I couldn't do because of the fear of being, of being sexually assaulted because of this experience that I had. Mm -hmm. And it's, it has been eye-opening to me just in to say, oh, you know, I, I think the way that I wrote it down at one point was, was now I'm understanding that sexual assault and sexual harassment is the ocean in which women swim. Mm. And I do and for the most part myself, and I'm I'm just speaking for myself, but I'm assuming that for men in general, since we don't swim in that same ocean, for the most part, some do, but since we don't swim in that same ocean, we don't really understand uh, that context. And I, you know, I think it's important for us to understand. And I do want to just say one thing. Uh, I just want to make sure that we understand that that um, I'm talking as a cis man, uh, transgender, uh, the transgender folks, uh, about 50% of them uh, will be sexually assaulted uh, in their lives. So they have a much higher <laughs> incident than, than men in general. Absolutely. And the rate is also higher for um, men who are cisgendered, but who are gay. Um, right. So we, we know yeah. that um, sexual orientation also plays a role into how 
people are treated and harassed in our society. Thank you for adding that piece to the discussion as well. You talked about this this ocean um, that women swim in, and it, it really, really resonates with me um, without going into any of my details because I don't need to relive that mess. Um, I just remember from the from the young age of two and three years old, being conditioned and socialized into being a certain way in order to avoid harassment and assault. And unfortunately, um, harassment has happened in so many different venues in so many different ways. Um, I can't remember how far back, but just, just, it's just so pervasive. It's so, it's so all consuming. It, it affects, um, one thing that I saw this week that, um, is, C- confirms the whiteness and the, the stretch of this is I saw white women and black women and Asian women and conservative women and liberal women and people who voted for Trump and people who voted for <laughs> Hillary and people outside and inside of those boundaries talk about how they had all been affected by harassment and assault in our system. In spite of the just the hugeness of this, I also saw men on social media or men in my own circle really struggle with talking about harassment, talking about assault. And so here's my question. If if it's so pervasive, if so many women have either been assaulted or been harassed, um, what does that say about men and why is it so hard to talk about? Why is it hard for men to have this conversation? Well, let me ask you a question first that'll help me answer that question. You what can't you answer call? a question with a question. <laughs> hey, if Jesus did it, then, well, okay, I'm not Jesus, all right, but <laughs> if Jesus did it, then it's okay for me too, right? Right? Okay. 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 No, I just, I think it'll help. What do you mean? you know, as a woman or or as people, what do you mean by by sexual assault or sexual harassment or both? What what exactly do you mean by that? So by assault, I I don't just mean rape. I, because I think that if that's the bar, whether or not someone has been assaulted, that that's really, really awful. I think that there is sometimes verbal and sometimes, um, so people make in, innuendos, people threaten women's space with their with their bodies, with their physical bodies. Um, sometimes people uh, or men. Uh, so I, I think that it's more than just rape. I think assault is more than rape. I think that rape is the most egregious of sexual assault, but that there is a spectrum. I think harassment is um it goes along with that and does not go as far as rape but is often verbal it's mental it's um preying on women preying on other people because of their presenting uh gender and sexuality and so i i don't think i have like concrete this is what this is i just know what it feels like when this happens and so i have by the grace of God, I thank God. I have never been assaulted in the most egregious form. But if I look back over my history, I'm like, there's definitely assault there. There's definitely a violation of personal space, personal boundaries, personal will um, by someone else, by someone outside of my body. And so that's why I define those terms loosely because I think if we say that sexual assault is only categorized as rape, we miss a lot of people who are being victimized in our society. And the if the statistics if the statistics say one in five women, I would I, I would estimate that that number is probably significantly more. And if we only define it in terms of rape we don't get an opportunity to talk about all of the things that we need to do in order to change that awful statistic as it is. It's interesting that the Department of Justice, when they talk about sexual assault, they they put it in three categories. They talk about that when they're talking about assault, 
harassment is something different again but when they're just talking about sexual assault they put it in the category of penetrative assault we would categorize rape which means uh the penetration mm -hmm. of someone uh with uh with someone's organ or an object um and then you have uh you have a um an assault which is just touching touching somebody else without permission uh on uh, parts of the body that are totally inappropriate uh to do that and then you have verbal assault um and all of that is to all of that is from the perspective of the person who is receiving that is demeaning and demoralizing and it makes them uh it, it uh, creates uh, it makes them unsafe not only there but mm -hmm. in other places as well mm -hmm. here's the so getting back to your original question thank you i'm getting there uh getting back to your original question about uh, so how do men take this first of all we have to understand that because men don't swim in the same ocean as women that we don't define sexual assault in the same way. And so if you have a, uh, and so if you have a man who is pushing a woman to have sex or is describing her in lewd terms, that person, that man feels like he is complimenting her. He feels like he's doing something positive to her because he can't put himself in the context in which that's the kind of language that is fearful, that is, uh, that is attacking. Um, he just doesn't understand that. An another man may feel like, oh, well, for me to, uh, uh, for me to uh, touch this woman in this way or for me to slap a woman in this way is a compliment, that it's not, it's not something derogatory or something that is, uh, that is actually assault. Uh, and so there they may look at it in a different way. They may say, oh, well, see, this is okay. My girlfriend is okay with this. So why shouldn't this person be? So it's a, so it's a different understanding right from the get-go. Uh, a, 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 they have a different definition. Um, and, uh, and, I think, and I think that the big reason for this is simply because men are not listening to women. Mm -hmm. Just not hearing, and and even with this, I, I am amazed. I saw one conversation where somebody basically a woman just put me to. She didn't tell her story, she didn't say anything, and a man comes, uh, responds to her on social media and says, "Oh, you know, it's not that big of a deal." <clears throat> I'm serious. He really said that. He says, wow. you know, it's not that big of a deal. You know, I mean, I've been through situations in which I've been controlled by a woman and it was a good, it was a good thing. It was a good opportunity for me. Wow. And so he just, he was totally ignoring the emotional context that she was presenting uh, her story. And she didn't even tell her story. All she said was me too. And he was already ignoring <clears throat> her, and dismissing her. Uh, and, and I am not saying that all men do this. There have been a lot of men who, who seem to really be willing to listen and understand. But wow, it amazes me how many men are just saying, you, uh, I may believe that this story happened to you, but it wasn't really as emotionally significant to you as you are saying it is. Mm. So they're just dismissing mm. what it is that they're saying. It's stunning, stunning to me. Yeah, I, I, yeah. And as you just talk about that, I just think about the parallels. I just can't help to think about the parallels between um, patriarchy and sexism and racism. Because I think that I know the same way that when we talk about race and we talk about things that have happened to us as a result of race, as a result of slavery and genocide, so many other things that the same level of erasure happens. Um, like that, that's, just, that's, the, that's the response of those who are in positions of power 
to deny, to minimize, and to um, to just discount what happens to to women, what happens to people of color, what happens to whomever is a victim. It's either minimizing it and saying that it didn't happen, or it's a justification. For women, it's, oh, she shouldn't have been wearing that dress. She shouldn't have been at that party. She shouldn't have been drinking. She shouldn't have been, she shouldn't have been, she shouldn't have been all to minimize and to dismiss the charges that are, that women, when they are victimized, either through harassment or assault, um, that they put on their, their victimizers, unfortunately. So because of the parallels, I wonder, one of the things I, I firmly believe is that patriarchy is one of the, the oldest sins in the world. I firmly believe that it's because of patriarchy um, and the way that men have historically been socialized to show up in the world by dominating others that we have racism and so many other isms in our country today and that other type of oppressions exist in the world because of the same system of patriarchy and dominance. And we talked about a little bit about this in our discussion about climate change and how we even interpret the scriptures in terms of um, people showing up in the world. So I believe because of that, we cannot really take care of racism and other oppression unless we address these gendered power dynamics. Does that resonate with you? And if so, where do you see opportunities in the church and society at large for justice with this more intersectional lens? Yeah, it completely resonates with me. I mean, I, I really believe that there is a, a large population of men out there who believe that they have the right to be sexually satisfied. That it, and that's historically, you know, that's what you see happening, that, that women are there uh, for the satisfaction of men, that that's, that's how they understand the world to be working. And so you have a lot of men nowadays, and uh, maybe some men who may have started a certain uh, quote rights organ uh, movement um, where they're basically saying hey you know we have uh, we have the right to be sexually satisfied and if you women aren't going to give us that right then we're going to demand it it's like well who gave that to you <laughs> since when is that the case you know sexuality is a partnership That's if right. you want to be involved if you want to be involved in that partnership, guess what? You got to earn it. And that doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, but especially if you're a man, because, uh, because frankly, so many of us assume that, uh, that sexuality, sexual satisfaction is our right. And I'm here to tell you guys, if you're listening to this, uh, the old, if you have a problem with sexual satisfaction, instead of looking to a woman, you know, there is always the option that God gave you, which is your hand. If you got it, you got it, because it's better to do that than to uh, than to sexually assault or harass a woman. You know, you got to uh, do what you do. And when it comes down to that, that's actually one of the things that I think that the church can do to... Uh, uh, one of the things that the church can do in order to reduce rape culture and reduce uh, sexual assault, which is to take away the stigma against masturbation. Men need to realize that the their that their primary sexual uh, satisfaction, if they consider it a need or whatever, it is not going to be dependent on somebody else. They've got to realize that that that's a uh, that that's a possibility, uh, and if we take away that possibility, then uh, as a church, and we say, well, this is impure and this is un this is uh, evil uh, for you to do this, uh, then we are taking away the uh, uh, we are taking away. Uh, another avenue, an avenue for uh, 
uh, for men to do that. And especially in a, uh, uh, in a culture which is so focused on, uh, on titillating men, on uh, giving them, uh, uh, giving them uh, reasons to be sexually, uh, to, to build up their lust. We live in a culture of lust not just sexual lust, all kinds of lust, um, but also sexual lust. We are built up in that. And, uh, and if we are surrounded by that, then it's going to happen that, uh, that, uh, that a release is totally, uh, is totally understandable and that it cannot be dependent on somebody else. Uh, it, you know, whether, uh, and whether you're married or not. So before you go ahead, I want to push back on that a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. Here's why I actually preached about this, not my masturbation, but I, I preached about rights that we champion in our country last week. And so some of the material is fresh. I, it's not just because I'm thinking about it on the flat. Um, <laughs> I, I really do, I resonate in terms of what you were saying in terms of like men feeling like they have this right to be sexually satisfied. And I think it goes with the pantheon of rights that we ascribe to people with wealth and power in this country who are usually cisgendered white men around having access to guns, around profit margin and bottom line, around free speech and so many other things that really the God, the culture of this country is self-fulfillment, self-actualization, me, 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 all day, not me. <laughs> but just this, this idea that if individuals are not the center, of their own destiny, of God's own heart and desire, um, that they'll be unhappy. And so when we talk about even the fulfillment of sexual desire, as you talked about, it is a partnership. It is one of the only needs that we have. Um, we have needs for eating, we have needs for sleep, we have needs for shelter. It is the only need that we have that can only be fulfilled by someone else. And I just wonder, even with um, saying that, well, if a woman is not going to provide that, you still have the resources to make provision for yourself. If we lose something in terms of what God has for us, like why there is that partnership, why he did create Eve to be this, to be this partner, to be this helpmate, to reflect back to Adam, the glory of God in herself, so that they're partners in this and Adam isn't going out on his own getting fulfillment without this partnership. I think there's something very spiritual, very significant about, which is why I still struggle with the liaise, the liaise fair um, sexual um, culture that is like whomever, whenever, however, and I still think that breaks God's heart because there's something sacred about this partnership that God seems to be intent on making as the foundation of humanity. So I I struggle with, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. I think that that is a better solution than, you know, rape and assault. And at the same time, I wonder this, this piece around partnership and when that's missing, what does self-control look like? What does that mean to restrain oneself? And instead of feeding into desire, saying that I'm going to, I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to not fulfill this desire. I am going to submit to Christ. I'm going to submit to my wife. I'm going to submit to my future children instead, instead of feeding my, my lust. Okay. Well, I think that, uh... I, I think that that works fine as an ideal, and I think that in real life, in the real, uh, in a real society where we have, uh, where we have our lusts being tossed at us, being tossed at our eyes all the time, that I think that what we need to do is, if we 
I'm not saying that we shouldn't have the ideal and say, yeah, sex is about partnership. It, it isn't, uh, and, and it is not about fulfillment by yourself. But I think that we also have to have, just like how Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he was saying, look, uh, you know, staying with one partner all your life, that's the ideal. However, if you're already separated, then, then you're going to have to deal with this one. And if you're already divorced, then you're going to have to deal with this one. And I think that's the same thing in this context, okay? Basically, the problem is not to say, is not to promote an ideal of partnership is the ideal sexually, absolutely. And then the second ideal or the or another ideal that is presented to us by Christ is, is uh, complete chastity. Those are the ideals. But I think it's, it's wrong to say if you can't control yourself, then masturbation is a sin. That's, what I, that's all I'm really saying. I'm saying masturbation is still a possibility. And if it comes between, uh, between uh, a if it comes between inappropriate behavior with other people or masturbation, then go for masturbation because at least that's not a sin. But if you're sexually inappropriate with somebody else, that is a sin. That is an attack. That is, uh, that is abuse. And I, I, I see where you're going with that. And again, I, like I said, I do appreciate it. It's still something, not because it's, and I'm not, arguing against the fact that it's not a sin. That's, that's not what I'm struggling with. What I'm struggling with is that I'm thinking through this. The, the peace around desire, the peace around I know we know that pornography is real. And that many men struggle with that. And that there's a whole culture out there around pornography and Playboy and all these other things. And I'm not saying that that's what you're talking about. But I I, I didn't think you were. Um, there is, I think that there's still this piece around if you can't get it, you should still have rights to get it somewhere else. And that's what I'm, I'm, I want to break the paradigm. I want to break the tendency for, for men to feel like they have to always fulfill this. this that's, that's the piece I want to get to. And I understand like we don't live in that society. Lusts are being fed. And still, if we're people of Christ, if we're people of the word, I believe that we have a responsibility to push our culture to a new idea and to a new way of being and a new way of doing things. The fact that patriarchy has made such a indelible mark on the world, a mark on our culture, that we have a duty and a responsibility to talk with our, I think, our sons, our, 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 our brothers, our uncles, our fathers about the way that we understand sex and the way that we understand desire and how we fulfill those desires. And so I'm, I'm struggling with the fact that it's not, and I'm still trying to make sense of this as I'm talking, so it may not necessarily be coming out in, with the best eloquent words, but I'm just saying that I feel like with that approach and that solution that we're still missing something, that we need to get down to the fact that why why is this such a stronghold? Why is sexual desire such a stronghold in this culture and in this world? Why does it have to be the center of someone's relationship, walk with God, just, just being? Why is that? I, I believe that there's a better way. I, and I don't know what that better way is. And so I'm speaking in it into existence more than I have definitive answers. But to me, it, there's something that's still amiss with that approach. I feel like we're, we're missing 
a big piece of the equation. And I'm not sure what that equation is. Um, but I, I'm struggling with that. If you can't do this, then do this. And I know that the, the, the way that Paul, and you see Jesus doing this, and you see Moses doing this, making concessions so that in order to prevent the bigger, more nastier sin or consequence, and still like, yeah, I'm going to leave it there because I'm going to keep rambling if I don't. Well, let me ask you this. So, uh, I mean, I just talked one. I, now, I made a whole list, actually, of 14 different ways that the church could help stop rape, rape culture. Sure. Let's talk about those. I know. Okay. So, uh, but, but I want to ask you. I know that you've got some ideas too. What do you think that the uh, that the church can do? Give me some more ideas, and then I'll give you some ideas, and and uh, we'll work on that for a bit. Sure. So I have several ideas. I did not make a list, and there are not fourteen ideas, so I'm not as. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll go with my list. So I think one of the we need to have honest conversations about sex in the church. We don't talk about sex at all, at all. The closest thing we talk about sex is purity culture and the way women should dress. Those are the only two things. When there is an incident where it's found out that a pastor or a leader has view pornography, there's shame. Um, but we never even talked about sex in the first place. And so, so it's like you're shaming and that's wrong because it's wrong, but we're not even talking about we're not even having healthy conversations about sex. So we need to have conversations about it. Um, we need to not be casual and be around the bush about it. We need to be able to sit down with youth and family and uh, everyone in our church to be able to have a, a healthy theology and a healthy approach to what, um, what sex is, what desires are, what boundaries are. Because if we spend so much time in the church and we don't have conversations about it, what a lost opportunity for the men and the women in our church. Because we, we know that people are having sex, so we might as well talk about it. We might as well have healthy conversations around what it means to be believers and have a healthy sex politic. Like, what does that, what does that mean? What does that look like? So people don't look to the world and form their own ideas based off of what they see on TV and ads and things of that nature. So for that, so that's one thing. I think the second thing, we need to stop demonizing women. I think what you see um, in, the, in these incidents in um, scripture sometimes about these women who play the harlot or who are adulterers or who in Proverbs, Proverbs is replete with examples of around the, the wicked woman, the woman who lead men astray. And I think what ends up happening is we take those stories that happen in scripture and we make a theology around it and we say, well, women, if you're cut, if, you're, if your skirt is too short and your blouse is too far down and you're at the wrong place and you're not keeping yourself pure and you're not doing all these things, then you can't, men can't be held accountable if you lead them astray. It's because something that you're doing. You are the women in that Proverbs is talking about. And so I think we need to stop that. We need to stop treating women like that. We need to stop treating women like they are the reason for the fall, the reason for sin, the reason for sexual desire. Because what ends up happening then is that when men violate these women, um, they get off. There's no, there's no explanation. There's no consoling because we automatically assume that when women are violated or assaulted or harassed, that's something that she did. And so we need to stop that. I think the other piece is we need to have a conversations with our men our, and our boys. Um, and we need to start as early as possible, not four, maybe seven or eight, around no meaning no. Around just because you have a sexual desire does not mean that you get to fulfill it. It means it's about restraint. It's about... Um, self-control and exercising, like what does it mean to do that in a healthy way? Not an unhealthy way. There are unhealthy ways to do that. And I'm not talking about asceticism here. I'm talking about restraint. Like how do we, how do we teach young men and boys to not give in to those temptations? 
um, to not give in to the things that society is offering as options, but to guard their hearts. Women have been guarding our hearts for a very, very long time. It's now time for men to do the same. <laughs> so to guard, to guard your heart, guard your eyes, um, do what you need to do to protect the women and girls around you so that they don't feel, um, they don't feel shame for being your press. They don't feel shame for just existing. I've had opportunities, um, since we are talking about church, I've had opportunities where, uh, I mean, as a preacher where people have sat me down before I preached to ask me what I was going to wear to make sure that it was appropriate enough. As a, And this happened maybe in my early 20s. I remember a couple of years ago, now in my early 30s, having that same, sitting myself down, thinking about what I'm going to wear to make sure that I was not accosted after I got off the stage. And even though um, I had this really beautiful dress on, I still, that was appropriate I still got accosted when I got off the stage. And so it's not its not what I wear. It's not what I don't wear. It's not how I style my hair. It's not what I do. It's because we're not teaching men that it's not okay. Sexual assault, sexual harassment is not okay. You groping someone after they just finished a sermon is not okay. You're definitely going to hell. Okay, maybe not that, but the, those types of behaviors and assumptions... They're not okay. And we can't keep putting the onus on women to protect our men. All right. You want to hear some of mine? Those are great. Those are those. In fact, I'm, I was looking at my list and I'm going, oh, yeah, you know, that's number four and that's number 12. That's really good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> on my uh, on my list, I have a, I just want to mention a couple other things. First of all, I think that from the pulpit, we need to be preaching uh, and uh, talking about rape myths and tell and telling our congregation that they are myths. We need to start. Uh, and if you want to know what what rape myths are, you have to do is go Google, Google rape myths. There are uh, they are out there, complete with statistics. So, for instance, there's a myth out there that says that most assault or or uh, myths, when they're reported, that they are uh, that there are, a lot of them are false. When the actual statistics show that only between two and eight percent of the reports are actually false. Most of them are absolutely true because women recognize that if they are going to report a rape then the chances are very high that they're going to be victimized as well. So they don't usually report rape. Um, that we need to be more concerned about the women who are not reporting rape than accusing women who are reporting rape. Uh, and then we also need to recognize that sexual assault, one of the rape myths is that, is that well, unless there's actually penetration, that it's not actually rape not true there's all kinds of things that are also uh, that also fall under the category of rape or fall under the category of assault and they are just as devastating uh, to women um, and so we need to be talking about rape myths we need to we need to make that open and because we need to stop the false information that is being passed around our churches around our leadership we need to we need to stop that another thing that, that we need to do is we need to hear people's stories if there are women who are brave enough to do it then we need to invite them to stand up and tell their stories about their assaults about how they felt about it we don't do that unless a woman is ready we never never going to approach anybody to uh, to talk about their trauma until uh, until they are ready but if there is someone who is ready and somebody who wants to talk about that um and for instance uh my mother uh did that she stood up in front of my church and talked about her uh the assault uh that she suffered uh and did that uh did that in front of a large group uh, of women and uh and mixed groups if you have people who are ready to do that then they can uh, uh then it is a uh, then it, it is important for us to hear those stories and to empathize, to say, yes, I'm feeling what you're feeling and I'm understanding that what you went through. On the other hand, we also need to have men who are ready to stand up and talk about their repentance 
from the sexual assault that they used to participate in. So we need to have men who are who are ready to say, look, I've repented this. I've gone through a process of of uh, confession and uh, and forgiveness. And I want to stand up and just say, you know, yes, I did this sexual assault. I was I was this person who participated in this. But now I've set this aside and I want to tell you what I've learned we need to have we need to have men who are going to stand up and once again be strong enough be bold enough uh so that way we can we can hear that and one last thing i want to mention is we really need to hear women's perspectives on scripture we need women our pulpits to look at the old testament and say see this passage here this passage is demeaning to women those people, uh, you know, this is giving allowance for people to assault women. Uh, or even the passage in Ecclesiastes. Have you heard the passage in Ecclesiastes, Ebony, uh, that, uh, that, says, <coughs> uh, that says one man out of a thousand is good, but, uh, but a good woman you can't find anywhere? Mm. Have you heard that one? No. Right, right there in Ecclesiastes, I think it's chapter 9. Anyway, we need to take these passages and we need to say, number one, these are demeaning to women. Number two, this is not Jesus. Jesus does not, uh, is not teaching us to, or he is teaching us to respect women, to love women as we want to be loved. That means to respect them as we want to be respected. Uh, and so we need to we need to take a stand, stand up and look, start reading scripture from a woman's perspective. Mm -hmm. We can understand what it is. We, we have heard men's perspective for 2000 years. We've heard men's yes. perspective. It is time to hear women's perspective on scripture to say, yeah, you know what? There's more to the story. There's more to the story of Ruth. There's more to the story of Esther. But you know what? There's also more to the story of Jesus and more to the story of Paul than just a male perspective. That's right. And we need we need to start listening to women's perspective on on what Scripture says. Thank you, Steve. I think those those are really great um, additions. I'm so glad that you said. Uh, women should share their testimonies and men should repent because I was having some questions. And so I'm glad that you um, emphasized both points. I think we've had a really full and rich discussion today. And so I just want to close us out. Uh, thanks for your contributions and for the discussion and back and forth as I sorted some things out in my own head. And, and thank you listeners for, for being here, for listening to this podcast um we thank ryan robinson for his amazing editing skills because there were definitely some moments in this video that need to be um edited out so do what you do ryan mad props to you not as, as many as last week though last week or last time was horrible he even wrote to us saying you know what you're right this one was really bad <laughs> It was bad. <laughs> Brian, I hope this week is better. I really do. Right. You you make a shine. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, if you have comments, um, if you have anything that could help uh, shed more light or more perspective on what we're talking about, even if you have resources you want to share that are pertinent to what we're talking about, please do email us, email us at bgwg at menonerds.com and menonerds is m-e-n-n-o-n-e-r-d-s again b-g-w-g at menonerds.com i think with that we're done thank you and have a good evening hey everyone this is paul walker if you like what you just heard be sure to check out more of what we have to offer at menonerds.com it's the hub for all things menonerds from there, you can learn more about these podcasts, syndicated blogs from people all over the world, books authored by some of our members, and a host of other exciting free resources for you and your church. 
Now there's one last thing. Uh, what we do costs a bit of money and we're always doing it on a volunteer basis. We have people that are committed to making this happen, but we could use more people. If you like what we do, please consider donating monthly. We have two options. You can either do a monthly donation through Patreon, or you can give a one-time donation at any time through PayPal. We love the work we do, but we do need your help to keep it going and to expand into new territory. If you would like to donate, check out menonerds.com slash donate. Thanks for listening, and as always, have a great day.